All right, so the time is now 8.05. We're gonna get started. Um, so thank you everyone again for joining us tonight for this very exciting webinar. Uh, my name is Dr. Kim Chi Tran. I'm a urologist in Scarborough and I'm one of the co-chairs of the Greenest Health MIG. Um, Dr. Uh, Caroline Newman, as well as Dr. Uh, Gilly adler Novo, um, also co-chairs of the MIG are here as well today to help us out. Um, and uh, we wanted to also acknowledge that CAPE has helped us out tremendously with tonight's event, as well as for our kids and MD moms. Um, we want this to be a fun and interactive session. And so I know you'll probably have a lot of questions for our fantastic panelists today. Um, so you'll see that below in the Zoom functions, there is a Q&A section. So if you can please try to type your questions in this area, um, we'll address them. If you happen to have any questions that get lost in the chat, then we'll try to find those as well. But if you put, address it in the Q&A session, I'll be able to find it a little bit easier. Um, so as you know, our OMA Medical Interests Group has been working around the theme of divestment for the past few months. Last month, you heard about the importance of divestment from medical organizations and institutions like the OMA itself. This webinar is available online for those who are interested and we'll post that link in the chat for you. This month though, we want to turn the focus to you, our audience. So perhaps you're in the beginning stages of your career. If your medical school was anything like mine, you had at best, two or less lectures about how to manage your money and your finances. Really, you're trying to remember all that stuff they taught you in high school about compound interest at this point in time. But this is okay, because you don't have any money as a medical student anyway. Or is it okay? Fast forward 10 years when you're finally your own boss, making a consultant salary. But all the same, you're juggling saving money, paying off debt, and making money. You want to make smart investments and maybe retire early. Fast forward yet an undisclosed amount of years more down the road. Finally, you can see the golden years of your practice. And you can see that permanent beach vacation looming in the horizon. So where am I going with this? We have heard people um, changing their diet, changing their mode of transportation, refusing plastic, all in the name of climate change. But when it comes to changing their investments, they have been unable to do so. Perhaps you are finding yourself in this boat. No matter what stage of life you're in, hopefully with tonight's lecture, we can help convince you that divesting your own personal money from fossil fuels is a good thing. With that, I'm so glad to be able to bring you Tim Nash and Matt Lee Pelkey, our two presenters for tonight. We're going to start off with Tim Nash. So Tim Nash is the founder of Good Investing, which is an investment planning firm with a focus on sustainable investing. Tim's blog, The Sustainable Economist, has inspired thousands of Canadians to invest according to their values with model portfolios to reflect different definitions of sustainable investing. Tim writes a bi-weekly column for the Toronto Star and is regularly featured in publications such as the CBC's The National, BNN Bloomberg's Market Call, and The Globe and Mail. He is here today to specifically teach us, physicians, how we can make smart and impactful green investments. So with that, I'd like to invite um, Tim to uh, share the board. Awesome, uh, thanks so much for having me. Uh, <clears throat> real honor to be here, really appreciate it. Um, all right, let me share my screen and get into my presentation. Um, I was able to sneak in a quick little question, Q&A in the chat there. Oh, hold on, skip, there we go. Don't wanna give away too many spoilers. All right, uh, can everybody see my slides? Can I get a little thumbs up? from the panelists, perfect, awesome. Okay, so uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, really happy to be here. I've got a little presentation that I'm gonna run through, um, uh, uh, just kind of going through my framework and my approach when it comes to sustainable investing. Uh, really my hope here is to give you a bit of a high level overview. Uh, if people wanna get into specifics, like look at specific ETFs or specific things, then you know, really happy to jump into the nitty gritty in the Q&A, um, but for now I think it's really important to have sort of this high level framework about kind of my, the language to use and, and how to think about environmentally responsible investing. I do have a few tips at the end, for specifically for doctors. I was like, okay, I've you know dealt with a fair few uh, uh, doctor clients in the past, and you know there there are a few things that that tend to keep popping up. So you know, really happy to to share those tips with you at the end. 
little teaser for you to hang in there till the end of the presentation. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, uh, I've been in this space for quite a while. Uh, my background is that I grew up in London, Ontario with my dad in the investment industry. So I sort of grew up around stocks and bonds. I studied economics and philosophy out at Dalhousie University in Halifax. And then I did my master's in sustainability in Sweden. Um, so I, I, I did my focus looking at this concept of socially responsible investing. And at the time that was a very contentious issue and people sort of automatically assumed lower financial returns that in order to uh, sort of, you know, save the world or, or do the right thing that you somehow had to sacrifice financials. And, and that just really hasn't been the case over the last 10, 11, 12 years. And, you know, I certainly don't expect it to be the case going forward. And I'm happy to sort of speak to some of those issues. Um, I've been at this for quite a while. You can see me here as baby Tim back in 2010, uh, going up against Kevin O'Leary. This was my first time on CBC, on national TV, talking about the, the size of the green economy. Um, and really it's been an incredible journey for me. Uh, wasn't always easy, but kind of stayed with it and really excited now that we are at such a cool moment in time where both the concepts of DIY investing, sort of do-it-yourself investing, as well as sustainable investing are both really taking off. And so for me, having had the experience in this space for so long, uh, it's really a cool time for me and my business, seeing a lot of growth, uh, seeing a lot of opportunity, and uh, really excited to, to sort of share kind of the framework I'm using and sort of where we're at and, and hopefully, you know, really how you can start to implement some of these concepts into your personal portfolio. Um, before I jump into the investment side, I do just want to share sort of my framework for kind of how I think about the world. Don't worry, I'm going to have lots of pie charts for you, right? Very common in the investment world, but I figured I would start you off with a cake chart. Uh, this is one of my favorite images uh, from a mentor of mine, Hazel Henderson. Um, so she's been writing and very active in the space for decades and decades. And this is a framework that she's used. And I find it's really helpful just to kind of contextualize what we're talking about here. Um, you know, really the, the, the bottom layer of the cake here, this sort of nice rich chocolate uh, cake is uh, sort of the color of soil and that is mother nature that obviously without nature, we don't exist, nothing exists, that we do depend on nature for our very survival. Uh, on top of that, we do have this idea of the love economy. Um, so this is going to be a lot of the unpaid labor that is absolutely fundamental to the way that we uh, structure our, our economy and our society. Uh, these are going to be things like parents looking after their kids, um, you know, kids looking after their parents and grandparents, all types of at home ca care, any type of volunteering that happens, you know, all of these wonderful things where you know, obviously people are, are giving and contributing and being a part of society, but where there's no money that's actually exchanging hands, um, right? That, that if there is no cash being exchanged, then it doesn't get counted by our economic system. You can see here over here sort of non-monetized that this doesn't get counted in our uh, economic measures. As well, we do have the underground economy, uh, the so-called black market, um, you know, lots of activity. If you've ever bought or sold anything on Craigslist or Kijiji, then, you know, congratulations, you've participated in the underground economy. Um, you know, and again, that's not going to be counted by our uh, accounting measures. Um, you can see here it was sort of GNP, gross national product. Um, now we use the term GDP, gross domestic product. Slight difference in the methodology, but it's the same concept that really when it comes to nature, when it comes to all the volunteerism and all the wonderful things that people are doing, and when it comes to the underground economy, you know, these things are just simply not captured in our measure of GDP at all. Instead, what is captured is the quote unquote public sector. And this is where, you know, a lot of our uh, uh, um, doctors are part of this public sector, um, where, you know, any, any money that is spent by the government, obviously, we depend on healthcare and education and uh, 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 in transportation infrastructure, all of those wonderful things, that without any of these things, without all of these things, the private sector couldn't exist. So, you know, I think it's really important to understand that, you know, really the private sector sits on top of all of these other aspects of our economy. And then obviously when we're talking about the stock market, 
really we're just looking at the icing on top of the cake of the private sector. That, that's not mom and pop shops. That's not sort of a lot of the, the for-profit private businesses that do drive, you know, vast majority of our economic activity. It really is the stock market, which is, you know, the sort of sliver on top. Uh, this is the sort of sugary goodness that, that, you know, people can kind of get high on that sugar. Um, the stock market can give you a rush as you're, uh, you know, uh, making money and investing. So, you know, just want to be clear that it's not the whole cake, that there is so much more to the economy. But obviously, what we're going to focus on tonight is this ICN sector, sector, is this sort of slice of the, the publicly traded private market. Uh, from there, you know, do want to acknowledge that just even talking about investing comes with like a huge amount of privilege to even just start talking about this topic. Um, you know, I think it's important to understand that here in Canada, you know, household median income is about 57k. So that's not for one person, that's for the household, right? So obviously, if you're earning more than that, then Congratulations, you're above the median income. And that a third of Canadians don't have an RSP or a TFSA, meaning that they have no savings at all, right? So really understanding that, that there is some privilege knowing that we're making so much money that we're able to put some away and kind of plan for the future for the retirement does come with a fair bit of privilege. And I want to acknowledge that. And I also want to acknowledge that sustainable investing is, it's not a panacea, it's not a silver bullet. This isn't kind of the one solution that's going to solve all of our problems. That obviously this is one sort of tool in our tool belt, that it is still really important that we look at our personal consumption decisions. It's still important that we participate in our democracy. It's important that we decide uh, what businesses we want to support with our consumption dollars. But obviously it does have an impact and I'll be getting into that, you know, what companies we want to support with our investment dollars. But but again, just want to be clear that I, I don't want anyone to think that I'm pushing this as like the one thing you have to do in order to create a sustainable world. Obviously, this is, uh, I believe, in diversity of tactics, but I feel that this is a very, very, very powerful tactic that people who are trying to advance uh, uh, sustainability should be using. So, you know, where I want to start with, and it's hard for me because I kind of come in this and everyone has a different level of knowledge when it comes to uh, uh, to investment. So I'm kind of coming into this assumption, knowing that thinking that people are assuming that people have at least sort of a cursory knowledge of investing in that, you know, you might have heard of mutual funds, you know, now a lot of people are talking about ETFs, exchange traded funds. So, you know, these are the most common ways for individual retail investors to participate in the stock market. You can see that in Canada, mutual funds still dominate. Like, you know, you can see here, it's about, I think, uh, uh, you know, $1.6 trillion, it looks like is invested in mutual funds. And ETFs are, you know, a fraction of that. So there's a long way to go in terms of this transition. The default setting for so many Canadians was to walk into a bank and get sold mutual funds. Whereas now what we're finding is that a lot of people are switching their approach. And instead of buying mutual funds with this, these very high fees, they're purchasing these ETFs or exchange traded funds. Uh, the reason I love ETFs is they're way cheaper. The fees are literally a fraction and I could spend a whole hour just talking to you about management fees and how you know mutual fund management fees just eat away at your investments over time. That, uh, that compound uh, return lesson, kimchi, that you learned in, in high school, you know, that mutual fund fees really eat into those compound returns quite directly. So with ETFs, they're just so much cheaper. So, um, and also they are more transparent that, you know, if you've ever spoken to an advisor or talked to someone who sells mutual funds and ask them kind of what's inside the mutual fund, that tends to be a very challenging question to answer. Uh, they're just really not transparent. They don't disclose the full list of their holdings on a day-to-day -day basis. They kind of have to report these snapshots uh, twice a year, but I end up sorting through sort of these 500 page PDFs to get a snapshot of what the mutual fund holdings were six months ago. Whereas ETFs are just so much more transparent. Um, I can just literally with a few clicks, get the entire list of holdings, which to me as a sustainable investor, that's what I need. I really want to know exactly what's inside 
And I need that information in order to make these sort of intentional decisions about where I'm investing. So generally speaking, you know, ETFs, I would say are sort of the way to go right now. I think I know there's a, a, um, a physicians investing Facebook group that's very, very popular. And I imagine if you are a part of that, you've heard plenty about ETFs and, you know, these wonderful exchange, exchange traded funds that are available. Um, if you do need more information or, you know, questions about that, again, happy to get into it in the Q&A, really understanding the difference. But for now, just accept that, that I think that, that ETFs are a better way to invest, that they serve the same purpose as a mutual fund, but are just going to save you a lot of money and fees and are going to have that transparency so that we can really see what's inside. Um, because ETFs are sort of, you know, the way to go now, this is a very popular option for a lot of Canadians. Uh, they tend to lean towards this strategy of the Canadian couch potato approach. Uh, this is a time where if we were all in a room together, I would ask you to raise your hand who's heard of the Canadian couch potato before. But, you know, I assume that, that most of you have. Um, if not, I'll just give you the quick little rundown. You know, this is a very standard way for Canadians to build an ETF portfolio. Really the couch potato is that we just kind of want to set it and forget it, right? But uh, what we are going to do is be deliberate about our percentages, about building this pie chart. Um, you can see here that, you know, in this case, we have a pie chart that's 40% bonds and then 60% stocks. And then the 60% stocks are split up between a nice balance of Canadian stocks, US stocks, and international stocks. So with this type of portfolio, it's really nice, uh, nicely diversified. We get a mix of both stocks and bonds. And then in terms of our stocks, we're going to be diversified by geography. And we're also going to have a really healthy mix of sectors inside. So lots of different companies. Um, you know, there are now ETFs that are sort of like these all-in-ones where you can buy one ETF and it's both stocks and bonds, which is pretty cool. Um, so, you know, lots of different options. But this is, I would say, the, 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 the traditional framework when it comes to DIY investing is that a lot of people just emulate this sort of couch potato portfolio. So what I've done, I, you know, my story is that, um, you know, I, I came into this actually uh, originally in my business model, I wanted to help foundations and endowments and, you know, these big pools of money uh, with responsible investments. But I really struggled with that for a while. And, and I got to a certain point where I had a little bit of my own money. I got an early inheritance from my grandpa and I decided how to invest my own money. And so I looked at this Canadian couch potato model and could really see why for a lot of people, this was the way to go. But when I opened it up and I looked at the companies that actually were inside of this sort of traditional couch potato portfolio, um, there's just a whole bunch of nasty stuff in here. So obviously, you know, Exxon, uh, uh, fossil fuels, to me, that was a no-go. Philip Morris, which is tobacco. Lockheed Martin, which is weapons. TC Energy, that's TransCanada, sort of rebranded as TC Energy, and so that's pipelines. And Barrett Gold, which just has an atrocious human rights record. That, you know, these were all companies that were in there that I was just like, no, like, I just, no, I can't. I just don't want to invest. So, you know, really that's when I started developing, oh, actually, you know, another point here, this actually is one of my favorite slides. Um, so I'm glad I put it in so soon that, you know, when we talk about the uh, carbon footprint of a lot of these actions, and Kim Chi mentioned, it is important, you know, let's stop flying as much. Um, you know, maybe people can buy an electric car or better yet, you know, ride their bicycle to and from work. And certainly we all should be eating less meat. Uh, completely agree with that. But these things kind of pale in comparison um, when it comes to the carbon footprint of an individual. If you have a 100K portfolio, like right away, the carbon footprint from this is as much as those things combined. Um, if you've got a 500K portfolio, you know, this is absolutely massive. And again, this is like an annual carbon footprint. So this is like every single year. Um, you know, having a child, obviously that's, you know, we want people to have kids, don't want to discourage that. But I think for most people that is the most sort of carbon intensive activity, uh, except if your portfolio is large enough, then you can see with a million dollar portfolio, you know, this is just absolutely huge. Um, this was a study that was done in 2018 uh, by a firm called Copower. And the assumption they did here, just to be clear about how they did it, is they did look at 100% stock portfolio. So there, there are no bonds in here, only stocks. And they did 50-50 between Canada and the rest of the world. 
And obviously the Canadian stock market has a really, really high carbon footprint that we have a lot of uh, 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 oil and gas, we have a lot of pipelines, we have a lot of mining companies, and we have a lot of banks that really the biggest sector in the Canadian stock market are banks. And the banks just invest in all of those very, very carbon intensive things. Um, so you'll be learning a little bit later about banks and kind of, you know, in terms of switching your uh, a checking and savings account. But I just want to be clear here that, you know, if you have been investing in sort of a, you know, a, a couch potato portfolio, a lot of people just haven't given this a huge amount of thought that sort of by default, you're going to have this massive carbon footprint in your portfolio that most people don't even think of. So, you know, really to me, this slide, I think is crucial in terms of understanding why divestment matters, at least on a personal level, that if I'm taking all of these other steps to reduce my personal carbon footprint, but I'm completely ignoring my investment portfolio, then, you know, I'm ignoring what is potentially the biggest share of my carbon footprint. Um, so, you know, back to this sort of couch potato portfolio, this is kind of the very standard thing. This is what most people have. And so what I did is I fell in love with this model, but I just didn't like the types of funds that they were using these sort of hyper diversified funds. There's all kinds of stuff in there that I just didn't want to own. So that's when I started building my own sustainable portfolios. Um, and these are model portfolios. Uh, I do have specific models up on my blog, sustainableeconomist.com. Um, I'll post a link to that sort of at the end on my final slide. Um, I, there are more ETFs coming out all the time now. So one of the things for me is I'm sort of struggling to keep up with all of these new options. And it's exciting. I'm, I'm taking some big steps towards improving my goodinvesting.com website. I'm hoping that my model portfolios are gonna sort of get migrated over there soon, but it hasn't happened right away. So what I wanna do right now is really just kind of share the framework that I use. And it's a very similar pie chart to that uh, uh, couch potato portfolio, but obviously I've done things a little bit differently. Um, that what I do is I kind of split it up between what I call sort of doing less evil and doing more good. So in terms of doing less evil, um, what we want to do is use, there are three different strategies that we use when it comes to sort of responsible investing. Um, the, the first one is called uh, negative screens. So these are going to be specific exclusions. Uh, typically, when it comes to responsible investing, this started in the religious communities. So we would exclude the quote unquote sin stocks, things like alcohol, tobacco, gambling, adult entertainment, things like that. Uh, obviously, now with uh, uh, climate change being such a huge issue, excluding fossil fuels and going fossil fuel will free is absolutely something that I think a lot of people are looking at. Uh, the second approach that we use is this uh, acronym ESG, which stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit deeper into this because to me, this is, I think, the uh, for me, one of the most exciting things in terms of the change theory and, and probably one of the more nuanced approaches, which is saying that maybe we won't get rid of all of the, uh, uh, for example, fossil fuel companies, but what we might do is get rid of the ones that have poor environmental, social, and governance performance, right? Kind of get rid of the worst of the worst. Um, the last strategy is uh, shareholder engagement. So this is the idea that by owning shares in a company, uh, you're able to vote at that company's annual general meeting. Now, we don't expect investors to actually show up to the meetings and vote. This is all kind of automated and there's a, a process to this called, called proxy voting. Uh, and that basically the funds that you buy, whether they're mutual funds or ETFs, that they will vote their shares for you. And that by choosing uh, specific funds that are active in their shareholder engagement, that what we can do is basically push companies more and more in the right direction. Uh, so these are sort of the three approaches that we use. Most funds are going to have a combination of all three. And a big part of it is sort of like where you are on this spectrum, that for some people, like shareholder engagement is really powerful. And they're like, you know what, I'm okay owning, you know, let's say uh, Suncor, you know, Suncor does have have a very good ESG score, right? So they're considered one of the more sustainable or responsible uh, uh, tar sands company. And that I'm going to use shareholder engagement to push Suncor in the right direction, right? Whereas other people are just going to say, no, nope, I don't want Suncor like thumbs down. I don't want to own one, not one penny of my money goes into oil stocks. So for them, you know, they're going to be more interested in using uh, funds that have a, a more a stringent negative screen. Um, so these are kind of the three different approaches. Again, there is like a wide spectrum of options, everything from like a small step in the right direction, 
all the way through to what I call like a squeaky clean portfolio, where it really is going uh, uh, pretty far on the sustainable side. The issue is that as we go through that spectrum, as things become more quote unquote squeaky clean or more sustainable, there are gonna be trade-offs. Uh, sometimes the fees are higher. Obviously you're gonna be less diversified. The more things you cut out means that, you know, the fewer things remain. So there are gonna be some trade-offs there. Um, that, 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 that investors should consider. Um, when it comes to ESG, uh, this to me is again, a really, really cool thing. So you can go to MSCI. I actually, I think this link might be old now. I might have to send the new link there because uh, I think they, they switch up their website, but you can, they do have a database. It's called their corporate search tool. And this is a company called MSCI, Morgan Stanley Capital Indexes. And what they do is they rate all of these different companies on environmental, social, and governance issues. Uh, so I just pulled a screenshot of Apple, just because Apple is like the biggest company. So I figured, hey, why not? Let's do Apple. And uh, you can see here that they have a rating of single A, which is like not bad, it's not great. Triple A would be sort of the, the most sustainable, and then double A, and then single A, then triple B, double B, single B. And then triple C would kind of be like the nastiest. These would be people who aren't reporting at all or just have very, very poor performance on environmental, social and governance metrics. Um, it's kind of cool. You can see Apple that they're not a laggard on any issue, which is pretty good, um, but they are average on quite a few issues. So corporate governance, you know, this is going to be the structure of the company. Uh, human capital development, this is going to be their ability to retrain, to, to, to sorry, uh, uh, attract and uh, retain employees and where there are opportunities for advancement within the company. Uh, privacy and data security, something they've been focusing on a lot lately. Uh, supply chain labor standards. This is where Apple got nailed. They got into a lot of trouble a while ago with their supply chain. That One of their suppliers, I believe it was uh, the company responsible for assembling the iPhones, was a Chinese company called Foxconn who was treating their employees very poorly. I remember reading stories where Foxconn had to uh, install nets around the factory building because employees were committing suicide. Like it really, really shocking labor conditions. Um, so this is an issue where they would have been a laggard at that moment in time, but they've now had to sort of clean up their act and they're now considered average there. And then uh, e-waste is also a huge problem in this space with how many people have a drawer full of electronic waste that is just there and you know all these wonderful metals and minerals and you know they're just sitting in a drawer somewhere. So e-waste is certainly a problem when it comes to Apple. Uh, that said, they are considered a leader in a couple different issues, um, opportunities in clean tech. So uh, Apple does um, uh, has has paid for a number of renewable energy projects, uh, huge solar and wind farms. Um, that basically allow them to say that 100% of their energy comes from renewable energy. Obviously, it's not totally the case, but it's just more, you know, they're not using 100% renewable, but what they're doing is ensuring that they're putting into the grid as much renewable energy as they're taking out of the grid, which is kind of cool. It's great that they're doing that. Um, as well, when it comes to controversial sourcing. So this is going to be things like uh, conflict minerals, and a lot of these rare earth minerals that are required for electronics, you know, there can be some major, major human rights issues when it comes to some of those uh, uh, minerals. So they are a leader when it comes to controversial sourcing and ensuring that they are not uh, procuring from those conflict sites. So this just gives you a little flavor. You know, you can go in, you can look at, at different companies. You know, we can see this. Um, there is some, I would say, you know, fuzziness with these ESG ratings. Uh, there are different firms that do it. MSCI is one of the biggest as well. There's a firm called Sustainalytics, which does them, you know, they're going to have different perspectives, different measurements, kind of weight things differently. A company might get a high score on one and, and an average score on the other. That's very common. As well, I do want to be clear when it comes to these ESG issues that they're not looking at what the company is selling. So, you know, you might get an instance where, for example, Tesla actually has a fairly poor ESG score. Uh, they don't treat their employees very well. Uh, their disclosure is really bad and their governance, like basically, the whole company is run by Elon Musk. They don't have a lot of, of transparency when it comes to the board of directors and say on pay and all that fun stuff. So Tesla actually has a fairly poor ESG score, even though they're making electric cars, where again, you could get a company like Suncor, which is a tar sands company, but they do have a really good ESG score. So know that really, you know, this isn't so much about what the company is selling. It's much more about their policies, their procedures, their reporting, you know, 
know, in their performance, like have they set targets and are they working towards achieving those targets? Um, so this is definitely something that's evolving. It's come a long way over the last decade and I expect it to continue to evolve. But to me, this is one of the most important things that for investors to start incorporating this environmental, social and governance data into their decision-making. To me, this is the ab an absolute no brainer that of course investors should be looking at these data points in addition to all of the financial analysis that's being done. Um, and, you know, really investors are catching on, like this is starting to go mainstream. Um, when I started doing this ESG, no one knew that, no one knew the acronym, nobody knew what the heck I was talking about. And now, you know, I turn on BNN or CNBC and these things are kind of all over the place. Here you can see, you know, I, I joke that when I started, people used to accuse me of being sort of a tree hugging hippie, you know, talk, uh, talking about sustainable investing, such a hippie. And so here are the wonderful hippies at RBC Global Asset Management. And what they're saying is that companies that score highly in terms of their approach to ESG factors tend to deliver higher cash returns on their investments than their sector peers. That this is, you know, RBC, the biggest bank in Canada, um, saying that ESG factors, you know, by looking at that and identifying companies that score better on these issues can result in, in better investment and higher returns on those investments. And the returns have been quite good. Um, so this is a report. Uh, I just pulled this uh, today. This is the most recent data that I could get. So this is through the end of the year 2020. Um, and this is from a group called RIA Canada, which is the Responsible Investment Association. And so what they do here is they track the performance of responsible investment global equity versus average global equity. So these sort of gray bars here, this is like average global equity, global stocks. If you've got like a global equity fund, this would be the average percentage return of those global equity funds. And you can see that when we look at the five year, the three year and very much in the last year that responsible investments have outperformed. Um, now this year, this past one year, like 2020, I think definitely was a bit of an anomaly. I don't expect this every year. And in fact, it's so much higher that it makes me a little bit worried. Sometimes these things have a way of sort of, you know, reverting to the mean, right? So, um, but really what this tells me is that certainly you don't need to sacrifice financial returns by doing responsible investments. And in fact, had you done responsible investments over the last five, 10 years, you would have outperformed. You would have actually done a little bit better. So again, you know, I want to be clear that with this approach, this is what I'm talking about is sort of like the doing less evil. Um, I'm not talking about investing in, you know, clean tech or renewable energy or anything like that. We'll talk about that in a moment. This is now just talking about having this broad mix of global stocks, but where we're doing negative screening, you know, choosing what we want to get rid of, where we're doing ESG analysis to make better decisions and have more complete information about the companies that we're investing in, and where we're doing shareholder engagement where our shares are being, the votes are pushing that company in a more sustainable direction that you can see here that really you don't need to sacrifice performance at all. And obviously with outperformance like we've seen in the last year, this is why everyone's talking about it. This is why it's become such a big thing that it is right now and why there are articles in the Globe and Mail and you know all, all these wonderful news outlets are finally catching on to this um, because investors are really starting to realize that, hey, wait a minute, you know, not only do I like not have to sacrifice returns by doing the right thing, but there's actually an opportunity for outperformance by doing the right thing, which for me in my line of work, it's just incredible to have that. Um, you know, one of the big reasons why there is this outperformance or sort of one of the big, uh, uh, you know, people always ask me, well, Tim, does it actually make a difference? You know, does me investing my money make a difference? And yeah, it does. Um, you know, one of the reasons why, and I'll get to my change theory in just a moment, but it's really important that people understand this idea of cost of capital. Uh, this to me is a really important economic concept. What this means is that companies need to raise capital in order to grow their operations. Okay. And there are different ways that they can do it. They can do it through debt, which is by issuing bonds. So when companies issue bonds, right, they're raising money, they're borrowing money for investors or they can issue equity, they can issue more shares. Now, when you issue equity, you are diluting, 
existing shareholders, right? Because you're putting more stocks in there, meaning that each share is worth a little bit less than it was before. So these are the different ways that companies can raise money. And what we see is that when it comes to the higher ESG companies, companies with higher ESG scores, they have a lower cost of capital. Right. And when we look at the world, like the cost of capital, it's not by a huge amount. You can see like 6.6%, you know, a little bit under that, all the way down to about 6.2%. So it's not like, I'm not saying that this is like game changing, like, you know, but what this means is that companies with higher ESG scores are able to raise capital at a lower cost, meaning that it's going to be easier for them to raise capital. It's going to be cheaper for them to raise capital. And it's going to make their projects that much more profitable, right? Because they're able to borrow at a lower rate. So this to me is one of the biggest incentives to companies um, for them to embrace ESG and to really become a leader within their sector is that you're going to be able to access capital at a lower rate which is absolutely huge. And so the way this impacts us is relates very specifically to my change theory. Um, that basically, you know, when we look at divestment, if we want to talk about something like fossil fuel divestment, you know, what's going to happen is that people are going to divest, right? So let's say you've got your traditional index funds, whatever, and you decide, okay, I'm going to switch over to the, the fossil fuel free ones. What this means is that there's lower demand for that company's shares, right? You sold your shares and you're not buying the back. And as fewer people want to buy them, what that's going to do is that's going to raise the cost of capital for those, you know, oil companies and pipelines. It's going to make it more expensive for them to raise money to be able to build these new projects. What this means is that those projects are going to be less profitable, right? It's like they're in, they're, their cost of capital is higher. That means whatever money they were going to make, they're not going to keep as much. This is going to impact their profitability. And as these companies are less profitable, guess what? more and more people are going to divest from them, right? So this really is this idea of a change theory, uh, sort of, you know, we often use the analogy, uh, Adam Smith talked about the invisible hand of the marketplace. And this is the invisible hand at work, just in the same way that, you know, when we buy organic or when we buy local, right, we're pushing up demand for those things, right? We're supporting those businesses with our consumption dollars in the same way our investment dollars have that same impact. Obviously, I'm not going to change the world with my RSP and TFSA. It's just such a small amount. But it, as more and more people do this, I expect that chart that I had, the gap between the high ESG and the low ESG companies to stretch out even further. That's when we're going to start to see even more systems change. And that as more investors start to invest in this manner, you know, it really does become a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy, this sort of positive feedback loop where all of a sudden, you know, these, these companies are going to have a hard time raising money as more people divest. Um, so from there, I'm going to shift a little bit more into the like doing more good stocks. So this is these are like green stocks, you know, um, there are a bunch of different uh, ETFs uh, that, that track different green sectors. Uh, the language that we use is we talk about these as themes. So these are what we call thematic funds. And these are going to track themes like renewable energy, clean technology or sustainability sort of broadly. Um, each one is going to have its own definition. Um, and that, you know, it's going to have its own sort of different characteristics there. Uh, really, the reason why I kind of in my pie chart have th these green stocks as like a smaller part of the pie is because they are often very, very volatile. Uh, I'm going to show you the chart in a few minutes, but these are things that do go up and down a lot more that obviously they're not as diversified and they tend to be in very high growth sectors like technology which are known for being a lot more volatile. So in my mind, you know, really you should avoid putting all of your money into green stocks. Sometimes people are like, Tim, I only want the doing more good stuff. I just want to invest in renewable energy. And it's like, okay, but you're going to take a lot of risk that sort of buckle in because the, the, the sort of the roller coaster is likely going to be a lot heavier. Um, you can see here, I took this screenshot today. Um, just to be able to show you sort of what I'm talking about. Um, and uh, so this blue line is the All Country World Index, right? So it's kind of the blue line that goes here. This is sort of a benchmark for the global stock market. 
So this blue line is just the global stock market. This is a standard sort of couch potato ETF. Um, it is in US dollars. All these are in US dollars. I just wanted to sort of keep the currencies uh, uh, standard and that there are a couple Canadian ones, but they just haven't been around for very long. So I can't get these nice five year charts. Uh, when we look at the orange one, this is SDG, which is the MSCI Global Impact ETF. And this one tracks the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which is super cool. Um, you can see that the orange one, you know, it really tracks the blue line quite closely, right? When one goes up, they both go up. When one falls, they both fall. It did lag a little bit. And then all of a sudden COVID hit and everything sort of crashed last year. And then you can see the orange one has come out of COVID much better than the all country world index which is pretty cool. So this is one of the more diversified ones, which is sort of, you know, tracks it a little bit more closely. Uh, from there, I have PZD, which is the, is the Invesco Clean Tech ETF. Now, this is one of my favorite green ones. It is quite diversified. It's got renewable energy, but it's also got energy efficiency. It's also got water and environmental services. So it's a bit of a broader definition of quote unquote green. And you can see here that it just, it is more volatile that in the ops, it goes up by more than the blue one, but in the downs, it does fall by more than the blue one. It's gonna come down a little bit further. Here you can really see it, right? They, they do move, they are what we say heavily correlated. Most things should be, stocks should be correlated with each other, but you can see that the green one and in the crash, it came down by quite a bit. But then after COVID, after the crash, it has bounced back up in a tremendous way. And all of the green stocks have done really, really well over the last year since the COVID crash. Obviously, a lot of momentum uh, politically in the US around uh, with Joe Biden winning. I think there's a lot of optimism that the US is going to start taking climate change seriously. And a lot of these green stocks are going to uh, start doing very well. Uh, from there, the last one I have is the purple one, which is ICLN, which is the iShares uh, Global Clean Energy ETF. So this is a bit more of like a sexy one where it's like just renewable energy. And this one does get a lot of attention for people that want to invest in renewable energy sort of as the next source. But you can see that it, it actually dragged for a very long period of time that most of the five, for most of the five years, if you invested five years ago, you know, you would have been well below the benchmark, right? And then it did start to shoot up pre-COVID. And then when COVID hit, it sank just like everything did. But then we've really seen it just absolutely rocket sort of like take off here. But you can see that from this would be sort of in probably around November when um, uh, 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 Biden won, that it just soared. And then in the last month, it has come down a huge amount that I think it, it was down like 25, 30% at one point uh, last week from the highs, right? So, you know, I just want to be clear here that, you know, that, that the market does move in sort of funny ways. It's very difficult to predict. And that when it comes to these sexier sort of green ones, you have to be really, really careful because they are going to be like super volatile. And I would be cautious at this moment in time because they are really high that they've kind of already seen the boost. Remember, the stock market is a forward looking indicator. So it's already kind of like priced in a lot of the action that we're seeing in the US and this assumption that green technologies are gonna do well in the future, right? A lot of that has already been priced in to the price of the shares. So, you know, I love doing this as part of the portfolio. It's done really well for me and my clients. Don't get me wrong, like it's been great, but this is definitely riskier stuff. I would never suggest someone put all of their money into green stocks. Most of it should be in sort of a doing less evil approach that's gonna track these benchmarks a lot more closely. And then you can carve out part of your portfolio for things that you do believe in, that, that you, a, you feel good about and B you think are gonna grow faster than the rest of the market. So just be cautious here is what I would say. And that don't, you know, don't go crazy on this. Um, I do see that tendency, people with high risk profile where they kind of want to YOLO and they want to put it all into Tesla or into renewable energy. And it's just like, okay, like just know what you're getting yourself into that it is going to be a bit of a roller coaster there. Um, so the change theory here is kind of the opposite, that people invest in renewable energy, clean technology. This is going to create higher demand for their shares. 
This is going to create a lower cost of capital for companies in the renewable energy space. This is going to give them the capital to be able to invest and hopefully be more profitable and grow even faster. And as these companies continue to grow and really start to take market share away from the, the incumbents, then you know more, even more people are going to invest. So again, it's the same change theory with the doing more good stuff as it is with the doing less evil stuff, except that you know in this case, it's really about choosing where to invest rather rather than the divestment piece of it. Um, the last piece I'm going to talk about, which to me, this is like the, the, the coolest part of the pie chart. This is the piece that I really love, which are impact bonds. Um, so this is, you know, we can call this impact investing. Um, there are some shares I can show you. There is some like really doing more good stuff on the stock side or on the equity, but most of these are going to be bonds. Um, and what this means is that when we invest in an impact bond, we are loaning money directly to a nonprofit or to a cooperative. So this is more like the crunchy granola, you know, high impact. This is not the stock market and, you know, doing it in that way. This really is a, a much more sort of local and direct form of impact investing. Um, really, this is that direct positive impact. This is not any of the, you know, invisible hand of the market. This is like, no, my money is going directly to, you know, building the things in my community that I want to see built. Um, so there are some really cool examples of this. Um, uh, CED Co-op. So this is a, a cooperative in Kitchen or Waterloo. They just launched a new offering. Um, I believe it's only available to Ontario residents. Uh, um, unfortunately, a lot of the co-ops, so CED is a co-op and then SolarShare is also a co-op. The way co-ops work is that they're regulated provincially. So unfortunately, both of these are sort of only available to Ontario residents. If you're in Ontario, you know, you're lucky. You kind of, we do tend to get the bulk of the options are here. Um, there, there are some that are spread out uh, geographically. So for example, in Nova Scotia, there's this really cool thing called FarmWorks. Um, and uh, that's uh, this really cool model. It's a, a, a community economic development investment fund, which is something very specific to Nova Scotia. And so again, you can only invest in farmworks if you're in Nova Scotia. So, you know, it, they really do vary province by province, um, but these are both gonna be renewable energy co-ops. So we're basically loaning money to them. I think with CD co-op, it might be shares. It might not be a bond. It might be, I think it's a, share, a preferred share that pays dividends. So a slightly different structure, but with solar share, I know it's a bond. Um, uh, Sketch is another cool example, and they actually just sold out. So this is a nonprofit here in Toronto that provides arts programming to homeless youth. Um, so really, really cool program. They do some amazing work here in Toronto. They've got this beautiful space and they are buying their space. And so in, or how does a nonprofit buy a building in downtown Toronto? Uh, they issue community bonds. So, um, so it's really cool. Unfortunately with these guys, you know, you can't hold them with an online broker. So a lot of us that are doing DIY investing, we're using something like, uh, you know, QTrade or Quest Trade or, you know, one of these online brokers and you just can't hold them inside of these online brokers. Um, I wouldn't even bother trying. Sometimes you can, but the fees are just kind of ridiculous. So I just wouldn't bother. Instead, what I would do is I would just invest directly with the organization. Um, because you're doing that, it does mean that you are going to pay taxes on the interest that, that you've earned. So if you're in a position where you know you don't have your tax shelters maxed out yet, so if you, you still have lots of room in your RSP or a TFSA, you might want to focus on like the traditional investments and do ETFs until you're at a point where RSP and TFSA are maxed out. At that point, congratulations. Congratulations, you're wealthy enough, you can afford to pay taxes, right? And since you're going to have to pay taxes on something, you might as, well pay, might as well pay taxes on these impact investments. But just be prepared for that, that because they are such a pain to hold inside of those registered accounts, we do typically assume that you're going to be paying taxes on that. Um, and these really are for people who want that direct impact that, you know, if someone is, if I'm just wearing my economist hat, you know, it's unlikely that I'm going to suggest that people should invest in these things that, you know, generally speaking, our money is better off in ETFs, um, both for liquidity, the fact that we can just sell it whenever we want, if we need that cash, um, but also just for, you know, diversification. Really, when it comes to these impact bonds, this is for people who want to carve out part of their money for that direct impact. Um, you know, and obviously we are making a return on our investment 
from this, but we are taking on a little bit more risk in order to do so by investing in a nonprofit or a co-op. Like these things aren't going to be rated. They're not going to be, uh, you know, traded in uh, any kind of uh, consistent manner. So there is going to be some additional risk here. So, you know, again, part of your portfolio, don't put all of your money into these types of impact investments as much as I love them. You really shouldn't put all of your money there. You wanna carve out part of your portfolio for these things. And this really is for people that kind of like get that warm fuzzy, that really want to like do something with their money and want that direct impact. Um, unfortunately, the market is still a little bit nascent. There aren't that many uh, impact bonds available right now. And often what happens is that the window opens and then it's available and then it sells out and the window closes. So it's kind of like they're available for a limited time only. So this is a bit of a trickier thing where you know you kind of have to know what's open, uh, uh, what's what's not open uh, based on the, the, the geographic scope that you're in. This is something that I often do help doctors with where you know if they have the rest of their portfolio sorted, they're like, Tim, okay, I've got that part, we're good to go there. But really I wanna work with you on this impact piece just because you know I've got all the research, I know which options are available, can help people kind of walk through. Again, these are not the most sort of like traditional type of investment. This is very much coloring outside the lines when it comes to uh, uh, the investment industry. Um, so again, just kind of want to come back to this idea of a pie chart of a sustainable portfolio that, you know, and obviously it's going to depend on you. It's going to depend on your age and your risk profile and your risk tolerance and all of those wonderful things. You know, this is something that we absolutely do. I work with clients to customize this pie chart for you specifically in your situation. But, you know, for the most part, the bulk of it is going to be these sort of doing less evil stocks that really should be the biggest chunk of your portfolio. From there, you know, you can carve out part of your investments for green stocks. You know, again, this is really going to depend on your risk profile, that this is side is going to be a little more volatile. But hey, if we're right and, you know, the U.S. is going to start taking climate change seriously, you know, there could be a lot of growth within the sector. From there, you know, you should have a really nice, generous part of your portfolio in these doing less evil bonds, where again, we're going to get rid of fossil fuels and weapons and Whatever nasty stuff you want to get rid of, we can absolutely get rid of those things as well, do the ESG analysis. Um, and then we'll carve out part of your portfolio for these impact bonds. That this probably is going to be a smaller slice than the others. Again, just because those things, you know, they're not really traditional, that, that they are uh, a, a little bit trickier and they're not always available when we want to buy them. So this is really the framework that I use. Um, there are lots of different options with my model portfolios. You can kind of like plug and play and use different ETFs to kind of like build your own portfolio. But this is the framework that I use that I think is really, really helpful. And this language around sort of doing less evil versus the green stuff, I think is helpful. A lot of people come to me and they, they think it's going to be this like magically, like perfectly sustainable portfolio. And it's like, no, no, no. You know, there is a spectrum like you want to figure out there's probably going to be some stuff in this doing less evil section that you might not love, that you might have to like plug your nose and, you know, invest in something that you don't love. But absolutely, we can get rid of the worst of the worst. Absolutely, we can divest from fossil fuels. Uh, those options didn't exist 10 years ago when I started, but they do exist now, which makes me really, really happy. Um, so I'm going to end with a couple tips specifically for doctors. I don't have a clock here, so hopefully I haven't gone way over. Uh, I think I'm good for time, but um, really uh, uh, when it comes to doctors specifically, uh, I've worked with a number of doctors and I just want to share with you a few of the lessons that I've learned from sort of mistakes that, that people have made. Um, the biggest one, the number one thing is to avoid lifestyle inflation. Um, so this is a huge issue that really, you know, people go from living like a student lifestyle that, you know, when you're in med school and in school for so long, you know, a lot of people live super frugally and, you know, really kind of keep their, their, their budgeting, their expenses very low. And then as soon as they actually like start their practice and start making money, right, they just kind of like start spending it. They get, uh, buy a house that's way bigger than what they need or rent a place that's way fancier than what they need. Uh, you know, they get a new car, they get new clothes, they start, you know, eating out at restaurants and taking all kinds of vacation and that this really is the biggest problem that you know uh, uh, really the best thing you can do for your retirement and and for putting money aside is keep your expenses low continue to live a frugal life sort of as, as best you can I'm not saying you know be cheap and go without you know or anything like that but just don't get caught in the trap 
of feeling that you need to spend as much money as the other doctors around you are. Um, I see this with doctors. I see it with lawyers. I see it with consultants that, you know, someone, they finish law school, they go to work for the firm, and now they're trying to like keep up with the partners. So they get the golf membership and they get the car and they go on the trips and they're trying, and it's just like, like pay yourself first, look after your, your, your own uh, personal financial situation first and really start to build the nest egg to, to get those compound returns working for you. Um, the second thing is to have a good accountant. You know, honestly, with doctors, there are a lot of tricky issues that pop up. I know there are all these questions around, should I incorporate or not? And those are things that, you know, I or a lot of other financial planners really can't help you with it. This is a tax question that this is, you know, having a good relationship with an accountant that can help you make these decisions is absolutely priceless. Um, you know, if you do decide to incorporate, it means you're going to have those extra filing uh, uh, duties. So, you know, having someone that can handle that for you. This is something where I've seen some people sort of cheap out on this and go with, you know, like a cheaper accountant or figure they can do it themselves and they make mistakes. Um, and those mistakes cost them a lot more money than what an accountant would have cost them in the first place. So have a good accountant, get a good accountant, you know, definitely uh, an important part of the, 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 the team. Uh, and then from there, the last piece is, you know, as you approach retirement, uh, it's really easy. Investments are super easy when you're in the accumulation phase, right? That as you're, when you're young and you're just trying to grow, 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 it's very simple, very straightforward. You know, it's really not hard. But as soon as you get to about 60 to 65 years old, that's when it starts to get a lot more complicated. That's when you have to start making decisions. Things like, you know, when do I get a CPP, Canadian Pension Plan? When do I start receiving that? When do I take my RSP and turn that into a RIP and start withdrawing that? Which accounts do I withdraw from first, right? Because at this point, you probably have an RSP, a TFSA, maybe a corporate margin account, maybe an individual uh, margin account, all these accounts. And so which one should you start pulling from first, right? These are all things where, you know, it's really going to make sense for you to uh, uh, pay for what we call a comprehensive retirement plan. Um, especially if you're going the DIY route, this is the type of thing, if you were paying someone fees, this is how they could sort of like earn their fees. They don't all do it, which drives me nuts, but this is the type of thing they could do to justify their fees. But for most of us, I think the path, the best path is to do it yourself up until you hit about 55 years old, at which point, you know, hire a financial planner to do this comprehensive retirement plan. They'll be able to build out a couple different scenarios for you, but it's just gonna make your life so much easier and give you the information that you need in order to make these decisions. Um, these, these things aren't cheap. Uh, the best uh, retirement plans I've seen, you know, often will run, you know, $8,000, $10,000, $12,000, but it's a one-time cost. And again, these things are worth their weight in gold that everyone I've, every client I've had that has done a comprehensive retirement plan, it has saved them so much more than the money that they spent on it. Um, you know, last things is, is that really, you know, again, uh, most people, what they're going to do is do sort of online investing for your RSP, your TFSA. And, you know, you, if you have an individual margin, which is sort of like an unregistered or taxable account, once those things are full, or, you know, I know a lot of people have incorporated and have likely have a corporate margin account. All of these things you can do online investing for. It's pretty straightforward. It's pretty simple. There are tools for us to like do it and make sure that you stay balanced. So, you know, really you can use online vesting for all of these things. And when it comes to those accounts, you know, this is where you want to choose sort of like the doing less evil or the doing more good ETFs, right? Where, you know, really you do want to stick with those funds um, just to be able to kind of keep things nice and diversified and simple. And then really when it comes to the impact bonds, that's where you go above and beyond. That's where you don't do those through the online uh, uh, platforms that typically you just do them directly. And you can do those as an individual. I can buy a community bond as an individual, but I can also buy it with my corporation. So it's very possible for my corporation to purchase a solar bond or a community bond and to hold that in the corporation's name. It's just that again, you're not gonna do it through an online broker. You're gonna invest with that nonprofit or that co-op directly, which is super cool.
So um, really, that's it for me. Uh, 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 I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, I've got my, you know, my website's here, goodinvesting.com. If you want to book a meeting with me, there's a little sort of free consultation button up in the right hand corner. You can book a free consult with myself or my colleague, Daryl, who's also fantastic. Um, if you want to check out my blog and my model portfolios, that's at sustainableeconomist.com. Uh, again, I am going to be bringing a lot of those resources over, but I haven't done that yet. So if you want the model portfolios, they're, uh, uh, um, you know, you you can check them out here. If you want to email me, tim at goodinvesting.com. If you've got questions that you don't feel comfortable bringing up in the Q&A that you want to talk privately, you know, by all means, you feel free to send me an email. And if you're on Twitter, you know, give me a follow, Tim Nash, uh, at Tim Nash CFP, you know, always happy to, to, to connect with like-minded people. Um, so I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Oh, I'm at 903. Okay, I went a little over there. I apologize but hopefully I didn't go too far over and you know, really happy to be able to jump into Q&A uh, a, a little bit later, maybe after Matthew's done. That was super interesting. Thank you so much for your passion and your interest in your work. It really shows through um, your talking, your presentation that was very, that was very well done and that was very informative. And I can see that we have a lot of um, chat and Q&A questions that we'll get to in a second, but let me just introduce our next speaker just share my screen here. So here we are. So um, this is Matt Lee Pelkey and he has a master's degree in adult education and community development and is currently on leave of absence from a PhD in urban planning. He and his wife Myrtle are the co-founders of Climate Pledge Collective and he has volunteered with other Toronto climate action groups like Toronto 350 and Fridays for Future. He's here today to uh, tell us about the bank switch campaign, which I think a lot of us will find quite interesting and applicable. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and Matt, you can feel free to take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, I'm Matt. I'll just start sharing my screen because that's how we, how it, how it goes now. Um, it'll take me one second though. That's also how it goes. There you go, you're good. All right, so, oh, it says it's loading. Uh, anyway, uh, the first slide is just about Climate Pledge Collective and the Bank Switch campaign. Uh, Climate Pledge Collective, we call ourselves a mom and pop climate shop, uh, and we try to build tools that uh, let ordinary people sort of take action on climate change. Uh, and the Bank Switch campaign is one of those tools. Um, there we go. Um, there we go. So the first thing I'm going to talk about very briefly is uh, what the Canadian banks are doing. Um, this comes from something called the Blanking on Climate Change uh, 2020 report. Uh, it has information uh, up till 2019, and there's a new one coming out uh, later this month, actually. Uh, but what you can see here is the top funders of fossil fuels uh, in the world. Uh, and the, the, all five of the big Canadian banks are in the top 20. Um, and, and RBC and TD are in the top 10. Uh, and what's really shocking about this is that uh, banks like JP Morgan Chase and Wells Fargo are much larger banks than RBC or TD. So as a percentage of their total lending, uh, the Canadian banks are perhaps the worst in the world in terms of funding fossil fuels. Um, so the bank switch campaign is distinct from sort of divesting your own uh, investments, which is also a great idea. Uh, it's focusing on the policies that Canadian banks hold. Because the second thing that's in the Banking on Climate Change report is a look on uh, policy scores, which means sort of, do they have a long-term plan? Uh, have they explicitly ruled out coal? Have they explicitly ruled out uh, Arctic drilling? And the big five Canadian banks are even worse here than they are in terms of total investment. Uh, they scored between 0 0.5 and three out of 200 points uh, available for policy scores. Uh, the best banks in this world were not getting 200. Uh, they were sort of in the 80, 60 out of 200 range. So it's not quite as big a fail as it sounds, but uh, it's still sort of shocking how bad the Canadian banks are on these issues. Um, but they are feeling the pressure. Um, a lot of grassroots groups have been working on this. You're starting to see it in the news more and more. Um, Tim Nash talks a lot about how you should move your banking to a credit union. Uh, and then just in the last sort of since last uh, October, TD came out with their statement. But BMO, just this week, uh, TD and RBC have now all 
committed to go, moving to net zero emissions in their financing activities by 2050. Uh, and Scotiabank says that they will do the same as well. Uh, and they've also pledged to put millions into sustainable financing. And uh, having organized a bit of around this issue, I was feeling pretty good about these announcements. They feel like wins at first, but I wanted to talk a little bit about what it actually means. Um, because what you see when you look into the details is that they say they'll be net zero by 2050, but what they plan to do in the next few years, there's no concrete commitments there. And projects that they're investing in right now will still be operational in 2050. So they may have gotten their returns back. They might not be invested in that project anymore, but it will still be emitting uh, carbon dioxide or methane after 2050, at which point we have to be at zero effectively. Um, and then just this week, I learned about something else shocking um, <laughs> in terms of their commitment to sustainable financing. Um, there's been a lot of organizing around Enbridge and the Line 3 pipeline, which is an expansion of a tar sands pipeline to ship Alberta tar sands oil into the US. Uh, and, and the activists in the US were targeting uh, a credit facility for general purpose funds that was coming due on March 31st. And then that credit facility was mysteriously canceled uh, because Enbridge had apparently come up with billions of dollars from somewhere else. And then last week, Enbridge announced that they had just received $1 billion in sustainable financing uh, from a sort of coalition of the big five Canadian banks. Uh, so what that means is that in their climate pledges, these banks have been pledging uh, to increase the amount of sustainable financing that they do. But the people who are winning the bulk of this money right now are fossil fuel companies. And perhaps they're doing something like, uh, in fact, I'm sure they have some sort of certification and they're doing something like putting uh, solar panels up to power the pumps for their pipelines. Uh, but they're still giving this money to these companies and that allows them to redirect money that would have gone to those expenses to something like building a larger tar sands pipeline. So uh, we're asking people to get involved with their bank and specifically we're asking you to start a dialogue about closing your accounts. I think if people feel morally they can't be involved in it and they wanna just close their accounts as quick as possible, they should do that. But we believe that you'll have a stronger impact if you have a relationship with your bank and you work, uh, work with them to, to pressure them to improve their policies. So what we ask that people do is that they sign up for the campaign online and then you contact your brand manager or whichever financial advisor you talk to the most and you explain to them that you're aware about their current policies and we have write-ups on uh, all of the, the bank's current policies on our website. And then you say that you're thinking about moving your money and or your mortgage uh, sometime within the next year uh, to the most sustainable option available. And right now that would be a credit union but conceivably, uh, some of the banks will, will take a real action on this beyond sort of the, the empty promises that they've started to make. And, and those empty promises are a huge leap forward because until last year, all five of the big Canadian banks just completely ignored this issue and pretended that there was no problem uh, with their fossil fuel financing. And then we just sort of ask that you wait uh, and, and let's see what they do. Uh, and then in the meantime, you might also want to open just a savings account or a small account with a credit union to see how you like it. Um, that's pretty much the campaign in a nutshell. Uh, we do think so far it's working. We know that the banks are talking about the campaign and, and that's a good thing. Uh, and we see that they're starting to make announcements and trying to big, build positive PR around their fossil fuel financing. Uh, one other thing, if you don't think you want to actually move your money, uh, we're currently working with Fridays for Future Toronto, the youth climate strike movement to write and produce uh, radio and podcast ads. And we're uh, crowdfunding for that. So I think there should be links in the chat. Uh, I'm sort of only seeing my screen uh, for signing up for more information on our campaign uh, and for the, the crowdfunding, if that's something that you're interested in donating to or sharing. Uh, but that's the presentation. Uh, this connects to a lot of things. It connects to political issues in Canada. It connects to a huge amount of issues. So. I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to question and answer to see sort of which angles of this people are interested in. But uh, yeah, thank you uh, for hearing about our campaign and uh, I'm happy to answer more questions. Thank you so much. Um, I guess just before we move on to the questions, I was just wondering um, how many people have gotten involved in the bank switch campaign? Do you have an estimate? I think uh, we have a account of the people who have officially signed up and, and done the actions, which is about 
uh, it's over 300 now. So we're, we're pretty pleased with that because it's a fairly large commitment to, to call your bank and, 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 and agree to move your money at a certain point. Um, but it's got a lot of attention on social media and there's a lot of other grassroots organizing around this. And I talked to people who have already moved their money to credit unions for this reason. So I think this movement is a lot bigger than just our signups, but uh, I think our signups are having an impact. So that's where we're at now. Oh, and the one thing I wanted to say also about that is originally when we started the campaign, we'd been asking people to move their money on Earth Day, April of this year. But I know that if you're just hearing about this now, moving all your bank accounts by that time is 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 completely unfeasible. So we're going to relaunch the campaign and let people sign up with the idea that you'll start talking now, work with your banks, and then maybe move your money next April if the banks haven't all made a new round of new announcements about what their, their policies are. Thank you so much. That's super exciting. And, and I really hope that it continues to gain traction and, and we get somewhere with the banks. Thanks so much for talking to us about that. Um, I'm going to move on to the Q&A section here. Um, I guess the first question in the Q&A se section is from Joanne Skipper, and she says that uh, we use the couch potato method with ETFs and find it hard to find more sustainable ETFs. Um, do you have any specific recommendations? So I think you may have touched upon this a bit, but Tim, I didn't know if you wanted to further elaborate. Yeah, um, it's tricky. There, there are so many options that are available now. And so it really depends on the spectrum. Um, I can speak specifically to fossil fuel free ones because those are fewer and far further between. Um, there aren't as many of them. So basically uh, Desjardins has uh, one, the ticker symbol is DRFG. Um, and that's gonna be a fossil fuel free global equity ETF. Um, the iShares, so iShares, which is owned by BlackRock, uh, they came up with a lineup called ESG Advanced ETFs. So it's kind of like there's a whole family of these ESG Advanced. They're all fossil fuel free. Um, they have one for Canada, one for US, one for uh, uh, what's called EAFE, Europe, Australia, and the Far East. Uh, there is an emerging markets one, but that's in US dollars, which is a little bit trickier. So, you know, you would have to convert your money into US dollars first uh, before being able to get the, the, the US dollar one. And that what's cool is someone did ask just before I came on, I was able to answer their question, uh, looking for these all in ones. So there are uh, these ETFs now that are a mix of both stocks and bonds. Um, I think a lot of people, there is this, I know there's this like, Facebook group for like physicians and finance, or I don't know exactly what it's called, but I think they're all about sort of like V-Grow or X-Grow, which are these all-in-ones. And so the fossil fuel free version of that is G-Grow. And so it's, it kind of follows the same pattern where there's G -E -Q -T for 100% stocks. G-Grow is like 80-20 stocks and bonds. Uh, G-Bal is balanced, so 60-40. And then G-CNS is sort of 60-40 the other way. 60% bonds, 40% stocks. So really cool that they came out with those. Um, you know, some of those aren't gonna go far enough, right? Like they're still gonna have the big banks. They're still gonna have mining companies in there. They do get rid of sort of the worst of the worst ESG and, you know, the human rights abusers. And, you know, they do get rid of this in stocks and fossil fuels. But, you know, again, you might kind of like close your own, have to plug your nose and and invest in those. Uh, the one that is part of my squeaky clean portfolio, which you know I do have that uh, as a model portfolio on the Sustainable Economist blog, is ETHI, which is the Global Sustainable Sustainability Leaders ETF from Verizon's. Um, that's what I would consider a squeaky clean one. That said, it is a fair bit less diversified than the other ones, and it does have a much higher concentration, not only in U.S. stocks, so it's not as globally diversified but it's also very heavy concentration in tech stocks, which tech, tech stocks do tend to be a little bit more volatile. So it's done well because tech stocks have done well, and that's been a part of it. But, you know, just again, really with the trade-off when it comes to a lot of these responsible investments, it's not necessarily that you have to sacrifice financial returns. It's more that you often have to accept a higher level of risk, that you're not as diversified or that you know the sector breakdown is such that it's just going to be a little bit more volatile. These it has outperformed, but you know the roller coaster has been a little bit more intense. So those are really, I would say, sort of like the three options right now in Canada: uh, DRFG from Desjardins, 
the iShares ESG advanced like family, there are a bunch in there. And then ETHI, which would be like a global equity, but you know, definitely you're sac sacrificing some diversification there. Um, BMO does have uh, their what's called ESG leaders ETFs, um, but there is a little bit of fossil fuels in there. I know, for example, Enbridge is in there. So, you know, if Enbridge is like a thumbs down, or like not one penny to Enbridge, then obviously that would not be a good fit. Awesome, thank you. Um, so the next question is, um, do you recommend G Grow? So I think you, you do. <laughs> so uh, I have to be, we have to, I really wanna be careful with this word recommend, okay. okay? And because for me, I have to be careful and we're recording this and like I have to assume too. So, but know that, you know, to me it like, people need to do their own homework and their own research. So to me, I'm happy to suggest G Grow and all of these other wonderful ETFs. But I think part of this exercise is like, don't go blindly into what someone tells you to do, right? Like do your homework, make sure you understand what's in there. Like at least take 10 minutes to, you know, look at the sector breakdown and to look at the companies that are actually inside. It's all available and transparent. You know, I often joke that people spend more time choosing an avocado in the grocery store than they spend choosing, you know, funds for their investment portfolio. And don't get me wrong. Like I know it's important to get a good avocado. Like I get it. But like, for goodness sake, like if you're investing in like your life state, your retirement nest egg, like spend some time to look at what's actually inside to make sure that you do understand what you're doing. Fair enough. Thank you very much. Um, second part of the second question from that person was also, um, can you compare SRIs versus regular ETFs? Um, I think like VTI. Hopefully I'm saying that right. Uh, yeah, VTI. So that's going to be like a, uh, I think that's like the Vanguard Total uh, Market ETF, okay. which is very similar to the ACWI that I kind of use as my benchmark. I'm happy to like chart these things. Like if, if I have a couple minutes, like I can throw them in a chart so that people can see um, kind of like relative performance there. But it is just going to be a little bit tricky. You know, you always have to make sure that you're kind of comparing things to the right sort of benchmark. But here, let me see. I won't. I won't go too down this rabbit hole. But um, I just shared my screen on Yahoo Finance. So if we do VTI, you know, now I think this one is in U.S. dollars, which it is. So you know, I do have to kind of like stick with the 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 U.S. dollar options here. Why don't I do a W? Uh, I want to see it's WMD, but I know that's not it. Give me one moment. Um, if I do this, I shares global equity. It's um, XWD. That's what it is. XWD. So this is the iShares MSCI World Index. This would be a Canadian dollar version of sort of VTI or something like that. Um, and then what I can do is I'll just use the ones that I just showed you. So DRFG, uh, the one from Dejal Dane, this one has dragged a little bit. Um, I'm happy to explain why but it has to do with this idea of a multi-factor approach and that growth stocks, so this, the, 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 the weighting methodology, um, you know, is a little bit different and that's why it's down a little bit, but you can see how highly it does correlate with the standard benchmark. From there, I can do GEQT, which is the 100% stock one from iShares. I'll leave that as light blue. It hasn't been around for as long. We're coming up on a year uh, soon. But you can see that the iShares, the GEQT, has outperformed the, uh, the benchmark. And then the last one is ETHI, which is just the Sustainability Leaders ETF, which has just been incredible. You can see here that, you know, it really has outperformed. But notice that especially, you know, over the last little while, like the ups and the downs and the ups and the downs, that it is sort of more volatile, that I expected it to be a little bit choppier. It really sort of has outperformed. If I go back to look at the two-year chart, you can see over the two years, you know, ETHI really has done quite well. Whereas, you know, GEQT, I expected to hug the benchmark a little bit closer. DRFG, you know, same thing. It's just that because they have, they use the multi-factor approach, um, it's, got, uh, 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 it's got less exposure to the large companies and the large companies have done really well over the last year. So, you know, it's pretty easy to like do that type of, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, analysis 
really what I can kind of confirm for people is that, you know, you don't have to sacrifice returns. And, you know, in fact, if you've done it well, like if you've, you know, taken a little bit more risk, then you certainly have increased your returns. Great, thank you. Um, I think Gilly is going to go through a chat question. Yeah, so there, there are several, can you hear me all right? Yeah, good. Uh, there are several questions in the chat that I think you've answered already, Tim. Um, Noam Berlin is asking about the X grow and V grow. I've just learned how to pronounce that, have no idea what that is. And you talk, and he asked for um, a compliment for that, and that is the G grow. And Noam, if, there, if you have another question regarding that, um, please add in the chat, but I think Tim has answered that already. Um, Roma Cassian is asking for really, really strict green um, investments, um, maybe with more modest returns. And I think you've answered that as well. And again, Roma, if you still have questions, of, do, you, do you have more? Yeah, I can, I can yeah. kind of speak to that. So, okay. And like, this is where it gets really hard for me because, you know, it's really, there is this tension between sort of me wearing my economist hat and me sort of wearing my sustainability hat, mm -hmm. right? And that unfortunately there just is a bit of a, a, a difference in approaches there. And that really like, you know, when it comes to a lot of these sort of doing less evil things, like they're not even close to perfect, okay? Mm -hmm. Like I wanna be clear that really what I'm trying to do here is obviously a big step in the right direction. So if the benchmark is like the standard, couch potato portfolio, my goodness, these are so much better than that. But, you know, when we hold it up to the lens of like where we need to be in, you know, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years as a sustainable society, they really don't go far enough. So that's where, you know, really what I would say in terms of investing in solutions, it really is the doing more good side of things, whether it's the, the impact bonds, whether it is sort of the more like themes that, that, that we can look at that are still ETFs, but you know, really a lot of that stuff, it's not that you're looking for more, you're gonna get more modest returns. That's not the way it works. Instead, what it means is that you're gonna to have to take a lot more risk. And that I think a lot of people have just seen so many investors go like whole hog into, you know, renewable energy or like hydrogen, you know, back when that was the thing in the early 2000s. And like, you know, these very like, I would say experimental technologies that just haven't been proven and they've completely lost their shirts. Like they got wiped and I could show you a chart. If I showed you the chart of the, that clean energy ETF from 2007, 2008, it crashed like a rock and then has taken a decade to get back to where it was. So, you know, it's just the type of thing where I really want to, would say, have a lot of caution there. And this is why my suggestion is always going to be to find a balance that, you know, invest, you know, I would say most of your money into things that, you know, hold your nose, you're not going to love, but are going to generate these market rates of return are going to ensure that you're going to have enough money in retirement. And then what you can do is, you know, with part of your portfolio, look at things that really are pushing things forward and whether it's thematic, whether it's impact bonds, this is where like you can get into some experimental stuff. Like there's like equity based crowdfunding, which is really cool. You can invest in startups and some of them are, you know, on the more experimental side, like if a regenerative agriculture company is going to pop up, it's going to be in that impact space or it's going to be in this like equity based crowdfunding. But these are, you know, really the amount of risk that you're taking. You need to be prepared to lose every dollar that you invest there. Um, the last thing I will say is just the criticism of BlackRock and their approach, which, you know, I do agree with BlackRock. It's hard for me because they're doing some good things. But again, there's always this question of does it go far enough? But what I would suggest, Roman, there's a new ETF that came out very recently. I think the ticker symbol is uh, JSTC. It's like justice. And this is one of the like best things that I've seen. One of the best ETFs. It is in US dollars. And it does have a fairly high MER. I think it's like 0 0.86, right? So this is, but in terms of the, the exclusions 
And in terms of the, you know, like it's not going to have, you know, a lot of the banks that own the fossil fuel assets. It's not going to have, you know, it really does look at things through a much more sort of social justice and equality lens, which to me is much needed. So there are some options. We need more options. I do expect more options. Again, the ecosystem, more supply equals more demand equals more supply equals more demand. And that, um, you know, I would just like, please just let me be the little angel on your shoulder. That's just like, you know, look after your retirement first in a way that is at least kind of coloring inside the lines. And then that gives us the freedom and the flexibility to then sort of color outside the lines with part of our portfolio to go into some of these more, you know, uh, uh, I would say experimental uh, technologies and processes. Thank you. Uh, so I hope that's, I think that's a very- It's tough. Uh, it's tough. Yeah, it is tough. It is tough. And I think everybody wants those, you, you know, know exactly which those uh, ETFs are. <laughs> uh, maybe at the end, you'll give us some tips. So maybe we'll sure. see. I'll go to the next question first, yeah. which is uh, if you go back to your slide, the MSCI ESG rating uh, yeah. slide, Lucas Coralio is asking if you can filter the grading criteria that they do um, or is it right. Yeah, no, it really is in terms of their scores. It is, they just have their methodology and it is what it is. Um, if, if, you know, if anyone is willing to uh, uh, donate, I think it's about $3,000 per month for access to their subscription tool, which, you know, allows you to do the deep dive and to play with it. There are also other tools. So there is something from a firm, I want to say it's um, ACT Analytics, ACT. But again, this is like thousands of dollars per month to get access to this. But what they're trying to do is to provide to say, okay, what are your priorities? And so when it gives these sort of like scoring uh, uh, assessments that it will consider those priorities. Um, but really unfortunately, like, you know, unless you wanna, you know, shell out for this, this ridiculous subscription, you know, we really are left with the very high level ESG scores, which unfortunately, you know, basically the methodology they use is they look at the issues that are most financially material to that sector so like with Apple, it's looking at the tech, tech sector and they look at the issues that are the most relevant for that. And those are the issues that are gonna have the heaviest weighting. And unfortunately we can't play with those using the high level scores. Mm -hmm. there's, there's another question that's tacked onto that and then we'll move to the Q&A and maybe sure. we have time back to the, to the chat. Um, the ESG, um, yeah. environmental social governance, uh, does the social governance actually impact the, e, the environmental or is just about doing good? So to be clear, these are three things, environment and then social and then governance. Mm -hmm. And absolutely governance is critical to environmental and social decision making. Okay. And the, the easiest way for me to talk about this is uh, uh, one of the, 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 the metrics out of, I, when I did my master's thesis, I looked at over 300 key performance indicators across these different areas. And the one that was most closely correlated to financial outperformance was percentage of women on the board of directors. Hmm. Gender diversity on the board of directors is absolutely critical to a company's sustainability strategy. And companies with gender diversity are way more open to viewing social and environmental risks as risks that are fundamentally that are material to that business. What I find is that when it's all male boards of directors, it's so easy for them to sweep it under the rug or to make it just like greenwashing like the sort of PR stuff that to me, that's like a, a governance issue that it's one of the top things that I look at. Uh, the one that I love, like if I was like in charge of things and could push for it more, the governance issue that I love is to have executive compensation tied to performance of environmental and social indicators. Uh, so there's just an announcement this week where Chipotle, um, they have just tied executive compensation to performance on some of these issues. And that the companies that do that, like that tells me that they're taking it seriously because now obviously like they want their bonuses and if their bonus is tied to greenhouse gas reductions or to, you know, better, uh, you know, to the, the salaries of the lowest paid employees, 
you know, that's going to have a dramatic impact right away. So when it comes to the governance, that is sort of how the, 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 the company operates. And I would say that those issues and specific indicators in there are going to have a direct relationship to their approach when it comes to the environmental and social issues. Excellent. Thank you so much. So I'll hand it over to Kim Chi for more questions from the Q&A. Thank you so much. Um, so one of the questions from uh, the audience here is uh, from Mary. So at age 72, we are already withdrawing from our RIF. Are we too late in our investing age to switch to sustainable ETFs? Uh, uh, oy. Okay, so this is, this is tricky, Mary. It depends where your money is currently invested. If you have ETFs, if you've managed to get this far with like a DIY approach using ETFs, then like, oh my goodness, first of all, congratulations. Cause like, you know, doing it yourself throughout that withdrawal phase is tricky. And I'm sure you've learned a lot through that process. If that's the case, then yeah, it's really simple. If you're already doing ETFs and doing it yourself, then, you know, we can just, you know, sell your unsustainable ETFs and buy sustainable ETFs very, very quickly, very easily. That said, if you're working with an advisor that has developed this retirement plan for you and has managed your RIF withdrawals and all these little ins and outs, I would not suggest at your age switching to a DIY approach. That this is the time in your life where they actually earn their fees, right? Because they have to manage all of these different things for you. Um, this is where I would say work with them to see what options are available. And then if they don't have options that are available, I could absolutely put you in touch with a full service manager. And now, you know, I'm making some assumptions that the portfolio is kind of like more than 250K, just because, you know, that's where they, a lot of these full service managers do have these minimums. This is the industry and sort of how it works. But assuming that your nest egg is, you know, a, a, a fair size, then, you know, I, you would be able to switch to a full service advisor that is fossil fuel free, that can also help you manage the intricacies of uh, really like the rest of your life. Um, as we get older, you know, two things happen. Number one is that it does get more complicated from a tax perspective, right? To manage all these withdrawals and to do it in an optimal way. But then also like you do have to start planning for end of life and some form of cognitive decline. I think, you know, speaking to an audience of doctors, I think I can be, you know, really honest and open about these issues and that I have seen some clients that in retirement, you know, started with the DIY approach and weren't able to keep it up. So, you know, if you were, if you're full service now to switch to a DIY, you're going to need a lot of help. You're going to need probably a, a retirement plan, you know, to be able to like give you that strategy. You're probably, you might need like co a coach like myself to help you manage the technology and make sure that you are comfortable with it. And then you are going to have to make sure that you've got all your paperwork in order um, for things like um, uh, power of attorney and everything else that if you become unable to be able to manage this on your own, that you need to have that backup plan like already in place. So, you know, certainly you can do it. I don't want to talk you out of it. You totally can do it. But really what I would say is that whatever, if you're at that age, whatever system you have right now, we kind of want to keep an ex a system like that. But do socially responsible or sustainable investments within that existing system. I think that answers it, I hope. Thank you so much. Um, just being cognizant of the time, it is 9.35 p.m. Are you okay for a couple more questions? And then whatever is left over, people can email you. Is that all right? I'm okay. That's fine. People can email me or just like set up a meeting with me. I do have a bit of a wait list. So, you know, but would really just know the emails for me. Like it, it, you don't expect an answer right away. And that, you know, really the way I make money on this is, is for people to be able to, you know, book clients with me and, you know, my prices and everything are on there. So if people do have very specific questions, you know, easiest thing is just to book a free consultation and to see whether, you know, I, I can provide that. Thank you but so yeah, much. yeah, I'll stick around. Okay, all right. I'll ask a few questions um, from a bit earlier. Um, what do you think of flow through shares in energy conservation? Oh, this is such a, a, an in the weeds question. Uh, flow through shares are a very specific structure, like a very specific structure, which I don't love. Uh, the reason I don't love them is because they're not liquid. 
Um, so this is a structure that was primarily used in extractive industries, oil and gas, pipelines, mining back in the day, where these are companies that don't have enough money to cover their expenses. And what we're doing is basically covering their expenses for them and get to write it off on our taxes. So instead of the company getting the expenses, they don't have any revenue yet, right? So they don't get to use those expenses from a tax. Instead, we basically pay their expenses for them and are then able to write that off against your expenses. So, you know, if you are a doctor with a high income, you're at a very high marginal tax rate, hey, having extra expenses, being able to write off expenses is gonna be like, you know, your accountant's gonna be happy. Like, oh, you're gonna reduce your tax bill. But from an investment perspective, generally speaking, there's no liquidity that you are gonna be locked into those flow through shares and that they are very risky. The type of company that's gonna use this mechanism is like early stage startup, you know, super high risk. And again, this falls under the, you know, don't do it with more money than you're prepared to lose. Um, because really it's just, there's, it's gonna depend so much on the company that you're doing. And this exposes you to what we call company specific risk, right? This is why we do ETFs instead of individual stocks so that we get diversification. It's like hundreds or thousands of companies instead of just one. Not only is this just one company, but this is like a baby itty bitty baby company with like pie in the sky dreams of this technology that, you know, you better do your due diligence before you do flow through shares. All right. Thank you so much. We'll do one last question. Sure. Um, so with some of the newer ETFs like GGRO, um, the volume is fairly low. Is it safe to dump a larger amount of money into them, like more than 100K? Yeah. Okay. So this is a good point um, that this is kind of the mechanism when it comes to ETFs. Uh, the way it works is that, you know, when we put in market orders in order for us to buy shares, someone else has to sell them. And absolutely, it's a very valid point that there isn't a huge amount of liquidity here. Right. So for me, you know, I track this stuff. If I'm successful with my business, then more and more people are going to be buying these things. Then, you know, there will be lots of liquidity. But the other piece that's really interesting is that sustainable investors tend to be very loyal investors and don't sell their shares very often. Right. Because if you're just buying something just for the money and just for the profit or whatever, as soon as it's not doing well, people, you know, lose faith and dump it. Whereas sustainable investors are really good at this approach of the couch potato where you never sell, where you just buy more. What this means is that for something like G Grow, there probably aren't going to be a lot of sellers uh, for those shares. Now, the way it works is that there is something with a um, what's called a, a, a market maker. So all of these ETFs are going to hire a company, like a bank, to be their market maker. The job of the market maker is to provide liquidity for that ETF. So that's kind of if, if you know someone wants to buy shares and no one else is selling, it's the job of the market maker to step in and to sell those shares. Now, you know, really it is a little bit tricky you know, when it comes to this, that especially at 100K, you know, you might want to like split that up into like three or four chunks or at least like three or four trades, right? You could do it on the same day, but sort of like over time. Um, whereas, you know, really if it's gonna be more, and I don't know what a good threshold is for this. If it's more than like, let's say a million dollars, then that's where I would say like, you can contact iShares directly and be like, hey, like I'm gonna buy like a million dollars worth of your shares. And they can actually create those shares for you, which means that you're not buying them from someone else selling them, that you can buy them directly from iShares. I've never worked with a client that high where they've been able to like call up BlackRock and be like, hey, create these ETF shares for me. But I do know that that is a market mechanism. So, you know, in terms of this really practical advice that I would say, if you're worried about liquidity, you wanna take two steps. Number one is you might want to consider doing it in tranches, right? So maybe, you know, my instinct would be like 20K at a time, you know, in five tranches. You can do them throughout the day, but like that way you can see that you're not pushing the price up. The second thing that I would strongly suggest is to use these things called limit orders. This is like the mechanism when you buy a stock or ETF, you can either do a market order or a limit order. When you do a market order, it's like a blank check. And that's where you can get in trouble by pushing the price up. Whereas when you do a limit order, you are setting a very specific price saying, I will not pay one penny more than these shares. Now, the problem is that if no one is willing to sell them, if your limit price is too low, no, you're not gonna get your shares. 
But what you can very easily do is modify your limit order and raise it by like a penny or like two pennies until it does go through. This is gonna prevent you from getting like totally ripped off by doing a market order. Like the worst thing you could do would be a market order for the full amount all at once, because that could push the price up, you know, and means that you're overpaying for those shares. So, you know, really my suggestion would be to break it up into tranches and to use limit orders of very specific limit prices. I usually do two pennies above the ask price and then wait for the first limit order to go through in that first tranche. And then you can see no, did I move the price or, oh, no, it's still, okay. And then from there, you can do your next limit order. Um, that's how I would approach those large purchases. Um, iShares, I have less concerns with. They are actually, BlackRock, I believe, is their own market maker. Um, so, you know, again, they have a vested interest in ensuring that liquidity and doing that. Where some of the other ones, like the Desjardins one, I know they've hired, I think it was like CIBC is their market maker. And like, I don't trust CIBC to like be looking after those ETFs to make sure that there's liquidity. But whereas with iShares BlackRock, you know, I think that they do have a vested interest in keeping them liquid. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, thank you again for coming to speak with us, Tim and Matt as well. I think this session was very informative and I think we all got a lot out of it. Um, for everyone else, I'm sorry if we were not able to get to all of your questions. There's obviously a lot of interest here. So when we post the webinar link, um, I will also uh, make sure that we have everybody's contact information just in yeah. case you had some follow-up questions or you wanted to talk to Tim in a little bit more detail about your personal finances. Um, and then just quickly, because I know it's almost bedtime for some people, I'm sure, um, I'm just going to share with you here. This is our contact information for Green as Health. If you wanted to know more information about us, if you wanted to follow us on social media or get our newsletters. Our next session is slated, um, oops, sorry, clicked too far. Um, our next session is on May 20th with Diane Sachs. So she is um, She's the awesome. former, on, she is great. And you've done some of her shows, I see. Or yeah, her, uh, she had me on her podcast and I've been, and I'm actually friends with her daughter and knew her from uh, CSI, the Center for Social Innovation. So she is just one of the smartest brains, uh, you know, in this space and she's doing some really cool stuff. We are really excited to have her. So um, if you guys want to look out for the next link, Tim, if you'd like to join us in the audience next time, you're more than welcome at Matt as well, if you'd like. Um, we can certainly send you that on as well. But um, it's been a treat having everybody here today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Jen, for coordinating everything behind the scenes wherever you might be, Jen. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you so much for an incredibly, I learned a lot as well. So it was a bonus to get to be on. All right, everybody have a great night. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.